In the last video, I shared my recent experience about setting up and selling at a local craft fair. One of the items that we brought to sell were these small pumpkin trays. Well, these trays happen to be the first true test of kind of a very small mini production run on my new Avid CNC. So in this video, I'm going to share that entire process with you, what I learned, what failed, what went well. And again, this is like getting a brand new Lamborghini and uh, testing it out for the first time. You're not gonna just open it, maybe some of you will, but you're not gonna just open it up right away and go 300 miles per hour. So this is a learning process. And uh, I think there's a lot of value here that I can't wait to share with you. So if you have any tips or tricks that come to mind when you're watching this video, leave them in the comments below so we can all learn from them. This video is sponsored by shopuploader.com. More on that in a minute. Links to all the products that I use in this video will be linked in the description below, so you can check those out. All right, let's jump right in. For my work holding, I'm using this Sherbon double-sided tape uh, for my hold down method. I get this stuff at my local Lowe's. Sometimes they're out of stock, and so I have to use other double-sided tapes, like the ones you saw me use uh, a couple of videos ago where the double-sided tape broke loose. But this stuff is completely different and I've had good results with it. Anyways, initially the reason I went with double-sided tape was to avoid the need for tabs. Anytime I can avoid using tabs, I try to do so. Even if it bites me in the butt sometimes. I also added this piece of plywood as a fixture on the long side of my stock just to add some additional support. This way my workpiece is supported physically on all three sides plus the double-sided tape. But as you can see here, I resorted back to my old ways of using screws. So the bowl and tray bit went fine uh, and I'm using a compression bit for the profile toolpath and I could see a little bit of movement, like just the ever so slightly uh, in the stock uh, at the bottom, right where the double-sided tape and the bed intersect. So I don't want to take any chances. I shut everything down and restarted it um, after just using some screws, zipping screws into the wasteboard. I'm telling you, this work holding method, it just doesn't break loose. And I love having the certainty with obviously wood products of just it not breaking loose. And so that's what I went with here. So speaking of the toolpaths, this is how I set them up. The first toolpath is the pocketing toolpath. Now, this toolpath ended up giving me a headache, and I'll explain that here in a second. For the roughing pocket toolpath, I used a 0.37 step over, 100 inches per minute, 14,000 RPMs at an eighth inch or 0.125 inches depth of cut. For the finishing pocket toolpath, I used a 0.07 step over, 100 inches per minute, 14,000 RPM, and the same depth of cut. Now, my strategy here was to go down to 3 eighths for roughing, and the final eighth to a half inch depth was the finishing toolpath. Now, that tighter step over, like I've mentioned in previous videos, gives a nice, smooth bottom on the tray limits sanding, and you get a nice finish. The next toolpath is the engraving toolpath. That's how I got these lines on the base of the tray that outline the pumpkin. And I really feel like this is what sets this tray off. It just, the extra detail looks very good. I'm using a 60 degree V-groove bit from Bits and Bits here. It's an astro-coated white side 1550. I'm running it at 70 inches per minute, 10,000 RPMs, and a 16th of an inch or 0 0.062 depth of cut. So I actually run this same exact toolpath twice. Run it once all the way through, and then I run it again all the way through. And what that does is it cleans up these lines really, really nicely. The final toolpath is the profile toolpath. For this, I'm using an astro-coated compression bit from Bits and Bits, part number 425CM250, and it is a quarter inch spile compression bit, like I mentioned. Other than the pocketing toolpath, which I'll get to here in a second, uh, all of these toolpaths worked. Would I say they worked great? Uh, probably not. 
Uh, all of them could use some refining and that will come as I gain more experience with this particular setup. This video is sponsored by shopuploader.com. Shop Uploader is the most powerful tool for Etsy sellers. Etsy doesn't allow sellers to bulk upload to their platform. Shop Uploader solves this problem by allowing sellers to upload one single spreadsheet to automate all the repetitive tasks away. I'm sure we can all agree that there's not enough time in the day, especially when you're running a small business. So I'm a fan of any product that gives me time back to spend in other places in my business. So whether you're managing 20 listings or a thousand listings, Shop Uploader can literally save you dozens to hundreds of hours a month of repetitive data entry tasks. Shop Uploader is offering a free seven day trial. All you have to do is use the link in the description below and use the code provided as well and you will have a free seven day trial to test it out for yourself. Thank you so much to Shop Uploader for sponsoring this video. All right, so now back to that stubborn pocketing toolpath. Where was my issue? So my issue came is when I would run my roughing toolpath and then I would come back with my finishing toolpath. What I found was the width of my pocket with my roughing toolpath versus the width of my pocket with my finishing toolpath were two different sizes. So when I would run my roughing toolpath, everything was fine. I'd come back and run my, my finishing toolpath. Uh, it wanted to push that the walls out wider. So what would happen is I was cutting a half inch material for probably a 16th of an inch. After messing with this for quite a while, I switched my strategy and I just went to one tool path. But I also wanted a nice clean finish on the bottom of my tray. And I didn't want it to take an hour to cut one tray. So my solution was, was to increase my depth of cut from an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch. So I would do it in two uh, passes. I would do a quarter inch and then a quarter inch at a 0 0.07 step over. So just over a 16th of an inch step over. It took a little trial and error to get the right feed rate, but I landed on between 60 and 70 inches per minute. Now the Avid could handle much greater speeds, but I quickly found out that the quarter inch shank bowl and tray bits could not. In fact, I broke three of them and here's some proof. So in response to that recently, I'm stopped messing around and I picked up a half inch shank bowl and tray bit. I haven't tried it out yet, but you know, that's where I'm talking about these recipes is like, okay, just because the CNC can do it doesn't mean your tooling can, doesn't mean your work holding can. And those are the things that I'm figuring out, sometimes the hard way. Come to find out a couple members of the CNC inner circle were having the same exact problem. If you don't know what the CNC Inner Circle is, it's my exclusive group for CNC business owners that are either starting or, or selling. And we talk about these types of topics all the time in that group. So if that's something that you're interested in, I will leave a link down in the description for you to check it out. But both Paul and Zach, members of the Inner Circle, were both having the same exact issue. So we were all running the same exact Vectric software. And so Paul decided to reach out to Vectric and see if they could help. Vectric was very responsive and we found out that we were setting the toolpaths up wrong in Vectric. Basically, in order to do the roughing and finishing toolpath strategy, you need to make sure your toolpath start depth is the same for both toolpaths. Then you can set your finishing toolpath pass depth to your total depth of your pocket. What we were doing is we were setting our finishing toolpath to start where our roughing pass left off. Now, I'm only talking about Vectric software here, and I'm sure it is different in other softwares. Overall, with all the kinks worked out, this setup that I showed you, it took about 20 minutes to carve three of these six inch in diameter uh, pumpkin trays. Like I said before, the CNC has much greater potential than that, but if your work holding and your tooling can't keep up or can't hold, then you're kind of wasting the capability of your CNC machine. So that's something to keep in mind. Now that I have all the trays cut, it was time for the finishing process. I broke all the sharp edges with sandpaper, hit the backs of the trays with the orbital sander, and I used the Dremel with a sanding attachment to clean up the engravings. And finally, using a sanding star and the drill press for final overall cleanup. After all the sanding was done, it was time for a dip in the food safe mineral oil. Like I mentioned in the intro, I made these trays to sell at a local craft fair. And although that we had a really successful day that day, 
this item didn't sell that well. But we do have another craft market show coming up here soon, right before Thanksgiving, and so we're gonna try them again. Nonetheless, it felt great to put the Avid CNC through its paces and get a little more comfortable with the workflow and setup and feeds and speeds. I have a long ways to go, a lot to learn, but these batching out products really helps kind of speed up and get familiar with things and really get in a workflow. And so that is the true value here, honestly, is just getting more comfortable. If you haven't, be sure to check out this playlist right here where I go through the setup of this entire setup, my Avid CNC and getting it up and running. As always, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next video. Thanks.